May the Lord bless him. Thank you, Brother Arnold. Thank you much. Well, we are glad to get back in the tabernacle again this morning. Just a a little bit uh, hoarse. We've had such a wonderful time this week. This has been a great week of blessings for me. And I'm sure it has for you also, many of you here. Many has received the Holy Ghost. That was our purpose in this meeting. And the reason we didn't advertise it way out was on the account of of, uh, no place to put the people. We just, night after night, the people just go away. That's our local people. And we just missed it among our folks here. And about the contribution just now for the baskets, that was meant for our local people. How That's our church thing. This is our regular Sunday school, see. And um, they, um, of course, if anyone wanted to help in that manner, we are, we'd be sure that it's taken to the needy. We have families in the city that don't have nothing, won't have nothing for Christmas. They're depending on this church. And so that way, why... It'll, it'll go for that purpose. Uh, one of the deacons, just tell them what it's for, or my sister back there will take it. Now, <clears throat> I hear we've already had baptismal service this morning. It kind of uh, beat me to that, didn't it? <laughs> well, then we'll just have another one tonight. <laughs> so, and, uh, have two of them. So we uh, suppose at least the pool will be filled or immediately after the service tonight, there will be a, another baptismal service. And some of them, they said, would have to be baptized. So Billy run up a few minutes ago and told me, he said, don't come right away because that Brother Neville had to baptize first and said there were many people there who had to go right away and they wasn't sure it was going to have baptism this morning. Remember, this pool is always open. Amen. Always, anytime, any hour of the day or night ready for baptism. Other ministers come in here use this pool to baptizing. So we're very glad of that. Here some time ago, the Park Methodist uh, Church, I was over there for a, a service of uh, preaching service. And the lovely brother said, I was over to Brother Bram's the other day to use that... Um, that um, I said, what is you call that thing? I said it'd be hard for a Methodist to say Babstree. <laughs> they had a little bowl there, they sprinkle in, you know, just a little thing sitting on. And I said it's too hard a word for a Methodist to say Babstree. I said that. He said we'd like to have one of them around here. I can't even believe in that. <laughs> so <clears throat> remember the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterian, anybody that wants to use it, there it is. It's open, waters freely, and we got a little stick of a little hot stick we put in there to try to warm it, but I'm telling you now, it doesn't warm it. <laughs> That's the coldest water I ever felt in my life. And I've baptized many times where I have to take my foot and kick the ice up the creek like that to baptize them, and then walk home, try to walk to where I had to stay, to change my clothes, and my clothes would freeze on me walking. I just could hardly make my steps. My pants legs just solid making my steps. And it wasn't as cold as this. That's the coldest water I ever seen in my life. I just never seen any water like that. Brother Kelly, it almost frees me to death every time I get in there. <laughs> so after that's right, when you're feeling good, it don't. Sister Kelly says when you're feeling good, it don't. We are happy for this happy group of people mixed up here in all different kinds of denominations. It's just God's children throw together. There's people in here that's Methodist, Baptist, Nazarene, Pilgrim Holiness, Catholic, Jehovah Witness, Christian Science, Pentecostal, everything throw together. Even a Jew. Even a Jew. <laughs> Praise the Lord for them. <laughs> Thank you. We're very happy for the Jew. <laughs> yes, sir. If it, if it hadn't have been for the Jew, I don't know where we'd have been. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's very fine. That's where heaven's going to be. Exactly. Where heaven's going to be. All gathered of all different denominations. And that's the reason we're sitting together in heavenly places. Now, Doc, that was a bit of psychology. I know it was. (laughs) 
You, I wasn't close enough to it. Being just a little horse this morning, it'll get in second gear after a while and get started off, you know, when it gets started, I believe. Now, I did have some questions come in last night pertaining yet to the meeting. If the Lord willing, I'll answer them real quick tonight uh, before we have the, the regular preaching service tonight. And so... Um, uh, so be sure to come tonight if you possibly can. And uh, if the Lord willing, I uh, want to preach on a very uh, vital subject of the closing of the revival tonight, as far as we know, unless the Holy Spirit would lead farther. Many of you, of course, will have to go back to your homes today or after this service, maybe this morning. We want to say we appreciate you so much. And we want to wish you a Merry Christmas and the best of the new year. God be with you and give you new things, more of the new life that you're seeking and hungering for. That's what I'm doing myself, is hungering for more of God. There's several of the questions. Is I just got a few in the room just then they gave me, and some brother gave my son last night some questions, and I didn't get a chance to get to them because I just stuck them in my pocket, and it was so late. And some of them pertain back again to that math or Hebrews uh, 6 and 4. Sister Mamie just said a few minutes ago that she's so happy to get a hold of that because she had asked the same question some time ago. That's a very, very striking thing. But I'm sure all of you got it, what it was. I hope you did. It is not a Christian that's filled with the Spirit. Now, if you go to Hebrews 10, you'll see that he said... In there, uh, it's different. Then he's talking the unpardonable sin to the Christian. But this is uh, to the filled person. But this is the person that's a borderline believer that just tasted. We have them in all churches. Just come to church and, oh, they appreciate what the Lord does, but they'll never move into it. They appreciate seeing someone heal, but they'll never make the effort of going out and praying for the sick and visiting the hospital or doing something that's right. They, like that. You've seen them kind. They've tasted. They've seen. Just like I said, the Canes, Canaanites or the Israelites, when they was nearing Canaan, they went almost in. They went there far enough to get the taste of fruits out of the land. But they said, oh, we're, we're not able. We, we can't do it. But Joshua and Caleb know they could do it because they had God's promise. And that's what Paul's trying to speak of, refer back there to them. That have... Come nigh unto it, so near, but they won't put their hand on it themselves. They either say, oh, I, I go to church, them churches. I go to the Holiness Church, Pentecostal Church. I go to this, but uh, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Oh, no, I haven't just yet did it. <laughs> See, there you are. Uh, but a real believer can't rest until he gets into it. He's just got to get out in there in it. See? Just kind of a, a borderline. Now, that's the person that Paul's speaking of. However, now this morning, it's a regular gospel message for this morning, the Lord willing. Uh, gave me enough voice. So, I think that's the announcements. I'm not sure, but I think that is, as far as I know. And Brother Neville has made the rest of them. Now, I want you all to know, if you're ever by this way, you that have to go home now and can't stay for the evening service, I want you to know if you're ever by here any time, I wish it was so you come by and hear our pastor. We've got a real pastor at this tabernacle, Brother Armand Neville. I ain't saying that because he's sitting here. I've known him for years. And he's never changed one bit. He's still Armand Neville, a servant of the Lord. You can depend on him. This is loyal, faithful, a wonderful preacher. I sit back there and I've heard preachers all over the world preach. But sometimes he preaches things that just astounds me. I tell you, he just carries you off and, and those little things that he uses. That I tell you, I, every time I come, I, bring, I get about 15 texts out of his sermon when I, when I come writing it down. Going home, oh my, wouldn't that make a message? Oh my, wouldn't that make a message? And just write it down. So come around and hear our brother Neville and associate with our people. They're poor people, real poor, but they love the Lord. And they'll love you. And so we're happy you were with us and pray that God will bless you. 
Now let us bow our heads just a moment before we approach the Word. Gracious Lord, we come now just as reverent as we know how to come. We come in the name of Jesus believing that you have promised us through him that you would hear anything that we would ask you in his name. And we pray, God, that you will make this a visitation to us here this morning. We want to thank you from the depths of our heart for what you have did for us this past week. Many sad hearts has been made happy. Many of the people has been made to rejoice and many who were confused in the word is now shouting the victory through Jesus Christ. We thank you for these things and we pray, Lord, that today will be another time that you'll visit with your people. And we're assembled here of all many different types, I would say, of denominational churches some with different beliefs of maybe friendly disagreeing upon the Scriptures, but not having that to be any barrier at all, even to a Jewish sister raised her hand. We are assembled in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We pray today that Your Spirit will be poured out afresh upon us. Give us a fresh baptism this morning, Lord, or a fresh filling and we ask that you'll heal the sick, the afflicted, those that are needy. Here's the man sitting here in a wheelchair. Others are out there perhaps with heart trouble, some with cancer. They're dying, Lord, and the precious doctors of our land has diagnosed their cases and gone down into it as deep as they could and maybe with operations. And still that devil holds on. He's determined to take their life. And he was, they may cut somewhere with their knife and tender hands to try to help that person. But that demon will slip off into another little corner and there break forth again. For he's well able to hide from the doctor. But God, he can't hide from you. You know right where he's at. And with the word of your faith and power, he'll have to move. We pray Thee today, God, that You'll make every evil thing leave the people, that they might have health and enjoy the blessings of the Lord our God. Amen. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Yes, Amen. Hallelujah. Now there is many handkerchiefs laying here, and we will pray over them. And if you don't have one here and you wish one, well, you just... Write us here to Post Office Box 325 and immediately we will send it right to you. <clears throat> That's found now in the book of Hebrew, uh, in the book of, uh, of the Acts, the 19th chapter, where we take handkerchiefs or aprons from the peoples to pray over them. Let us turn this morning now in the Scriptures to the book of Isaiah, the first chapter. Isaiah 1, while we read a portion of the Scripture. And while you're turning to this book to follow us in the reading, we are want to speak something about the healing service coming up. Now, we do not try to say that we make divine healing here a major because divine healing is a minor. And you can never major on a minor. But we believe that Jesus Christ's ministry, 86% of it was divine healing. And in catching the people's attention by divine healing, brought the realization that He was God. And they, uh, He said, if you can't believe Me to be that, then believe the works that I do. For... If I do not the works of my Father, then believe me not. But if I do the works of the Father and you can't believe me, then believe the works. 
See, as a man, he made himself God. On the cross or just before the cross, they said to him, We do not stone thee for a good work that you've done, but we stone thee because you're a man making yourself God. He was God. He was. God was in him. And so then he said, If you can't believe me, believe the works that I do. They just believe the works that they're of God. Well, now the same thing is today. There's no man on earth as a God. Certainly not. We're all human beings. Everyone born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. But as we've been through it so plainly this week, to show that God once lived above His creature because of sin, that He lived with His creature in the form of a body, Jesus Christ, put His tent with us, dwelt with us, made flesh with us, to suffer sin and pains, agony and things that we do. Then He sanctified a church that He might dwell in. So it was God above us, God with us, God in us. Jesus said it that day, you'll know that. I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, and I and you and you and me. You see there, it's God working through. So when a person is so completely yielded to the Holy Spirit and speaking, it is not the person speaking. I know that by experience. Of my little experience with Christ, I found the times that that He would permit me to yield myself to Him till I didn't know what I was saying. And I wouldn't have said that for nothing in the world. But he said it. Had he sitting back there, uh, the lady, the other day when this new ministry, which I trust will come in this morning, and all of you's heard about it, and when we were sitting, and there's at least eight or ten right here now were sitting present at that time, and when the Holy Spirit turned to that woman and told her to ask anything that she desired and it would be given to her. You think I would have said that? If I could, I'd say it right now. But I couldn't say that. And I trembled. I was so weak. Brother Banks Wood standing there was sitting next to me. And the perspiration run off of my hands and I was so weak till I got up and left the house. It scared me so bad. But the woman asked for one of the greatest things that anyone could ask and received it. See, that was God. That wasn't a man. Man can't do those things. Jesus said to the tree, No man eateth from thee. And the disciples, the next day, how quick it started to work right then. The next day it had begun to wither. And they said, Behold how quick the tree withers. And he said, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, if ye, not if I, but if you, whosoever will say to this mountain, be moved and don't doubt, but believe what they've said will come to pass, you can have what you have said. Amen. That's God in you. See? Who can move a mountain but God? <laughs> Who could bring things to pass like that but God? So, you see, beyond any controversy, God is in His people. Amen. Then we are to respect one another. Amen. We are to love one another. Beyond our denominational bearers, we are to love one another. Amen. Anyhow, no matter if we cannot agree, maybe the apostles, they couldn't agree. They won't know who's going to be the greatest in many things. John, Mark, and, and Paul there, they had a, and Peter and Paul had a disagreement. But the bonds of love, that's what we're trying to contend for today. That all Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterian, Lutheran, whatever it is, we're all together as a Christian unit. Now we're trying to get filled with the Spirit to move up closer to God. That's the vision. Now have you got Isaiah 1? Let's begin with the 14th verse. 
And I'm going to take a text, the Lord willing, from the 18th verse to draw my context. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make any prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away evil, uh, uh, evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widows. Come now. And let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. You know, lately we have heard so much about conferences, people getting together. That's what God's speaking of here, a conference with His people. Come and let us reason together. That's what we've been doing the last few days. And so much of the nation is, and the national affairs today is based upon conferences. Here some time ago, I can easily recall it, and many other people can recall the Big Four conference. They got four of the great leaders of the world together, of the peace-loving world. And they had a conference. And in this conference, they tried to decide uh, what would be best to do. And then we had the Geneva conference recently. Where at Geneva, the peace-loving people of the world assemble themselves together to ask about and confer with one another about world peace. That was called the Geneva a Conference. Then, if I'm not mistaken, they had a, a Paris conference here not some time ago. And they all met at Paris to discuss problems and to try to bring about a peace. And now our lovely president, Dwight Eisenhower, is touring the free world. The papers are full of it and the radio of Mr. Eisenhower's. Uh, talks with the free people of the world. Conference after conference, he's trying to, to get to, and the, they tell in the papers about how that he's, uh, he's welcome in so many places and how they sang the American song or rise the flag up or raise the flag rather, uh, up when he comes and, and different one gives him gifts and so forth. It's the people that are peace-loving nations. And I think that we ought to pray for Mr. Eisenhower while they're putting forth all their efforts to try to keep this country where we can have meetings like this. Amen. To be free. America in all of its sin and all of its trouble 
It's still the best the world's got. I believe that. And God help it to be and always remain that way. For we have some dearly principles that this old earth has been bathed in blood to keep these principles. So I think we should pray all the time that God will be with Mr. Eisenhower, old and his health not too good and, and uh, the man in his social standing and making speeches and trying his best. Even if you disagree with him in politics, pray for him now. It's your nation that's at stake. Amen. What is conferences help for? What's the reason for these conferences? There's got to be a reason or they wouldn't have these conferences. They've got to come to a certain decision of what they're going to do. That's what a conference is for. It's to make a decision. Man in one place and other place in different minds and little things rise up here and something over here and back here. Then they've got to come together and hold a conference and then make a decision what they're going to do about it. That's why they're held. And then, after the decision or the conference is set, they've got to have a certain place to have this conference. And if you'll notice that they're always trying to find some place that's beautiful. I've been in Geneva, where the Geneva conference was in Paris and, and different places where the conferences has been held. I've been to the UN building and oh, it is beautiful, especially in Geneva. And then in there, they, I believe they try to select these places so that the attraction, there's something that if it's peaceful and, and attractive, it seems to work on the human spirit. I believe that's true. Many times for myself to climb a mountain, watch a sunset, or just thrills me. It looks like all my differences are settled. A place, a place, selected place, where this conference must be held. And then there's got to be decisions to be made. And then another thought I want you to get is this in a conference, that they never have a conference unless there is a crucial need. It's at a, a strenuous time when con conferences is held. In the time of the Big Four meeting, it was a conference because that World War uh, II was almost getting out of hands. And they had to get together and put all their strategy together and work out something. Mr. Churchill and Roosevelt and the others trying to put their senses together to pool it, to find out what's best because it was a crucial moment. It was a time when the whole free world could have blown up. And Hitler today would have been dictator of the world. Then we'd have not had this meeting today. That's why conferences is held. And, uh, and the reason they put them in selected places. And, and the reason that they have to have them. And if, if we're forced to a conference. That's the way they meet. And there's been great conferences. There's no doubt in my mind and time would not permit me and my voice to go on and say of the other great conferences down through the age that I have read about. In the days of Pharaoh and so forth. But the great conferences of this world system has been held and then God's held some great conferences. 
There come a time in God's great economy where there had to be a conference held. And the first one that I could call of for this earth was in the Garden of Eden. When the angels of God came home weeping, saying, Your child has fallen. He's sinned and he's broken your commandments. Something had to be done. The creature of God had fallen from grace and was subject unto eternal separation from the presence of his God and his Maker. It was a crucial moment. For the King of Heaven had said, The day you eat thereof, that day you die. And putting his trust into his son, his son had broke his commandment. There had to be something done. It was his creation. It was a work of his own hand. It was the love of his heart. The apple of his eye. Something must be done. So there had to be a conference called. God selected a certain tree in the Garden of Eden. And after he had thrown out old bloody sheepskins into the Behind the bushes he called Adam and Eve and there he made a conference. Talked over and made a remedy for this horrible thing that his children had done. God's conference. And there was a decision made. Always at a conference there is a decision. And God made a decision that because that Eve had, when he held her at the witness stand, because she had took life from the world, she would have to bring life to the world. And to Adam, and to the serpent, and of course that being the head of the race, all the race under it fell with Adam. Then I can call in my memory another conference of a runaway prophet that had got weak in his decisions and he thought the task was too great and he had run away and married him a wife and got back into the wilderness and been there for 40 years. A prophet anointed of God with a great commission born in the world, a prophet. But yet at the very threat of his mistake he had did to take it in his own hands instead of following the instructions of God, he killed a man. And at the threat and the fear of Pharaoh, he ran into the wilderness. And there was 40 years. And the slaves of Egypt, the task was so great. Their backs were so sore. Their hearts were so broken. Until their cries come before God till he was forced to a conference. There's a way of forcing a conference. You can do it in your life. A showdown. The burdens of the people and the cries were so great till God had to be Forced to call a conference. When God makes a decision, it's got to be that way. So he had already, before the foundation of the world, had put a man on the Lamb's book of life for the purpose of delivering them people. 
All things, things was pre-planned by God. That man's name was Moses, his servant. So before the foundation of the world, Moses was chose to deliver the people. And Moses had failed God. That should give us co confidence and courage. We who have failed God, we still have hopes. We fail Him as a church. We fail Him as a people. But let's call a conference. Amen. Talk it over with Him. See what He'll tell us. See what decision we'll derive at. And God's man had failed. God had to call a conference. He couldn't use no one else. He'd selected Moses. So he goes down into the wilderness. Somewhere in the back of the desert near Sinai. And he selected a top of a mountain and a bush. A certain place. He thought, I'll bring Moses up here. This will be a good place. Away from his sheep. Away from his wife. Away from his children. Away from all the people. And I'll call a conference with him. There when he spoke to the prophet, they finally arrived at the subject. I've heard the cries of my people. That's why I called you, Moses. I've heard the cries of my people down there. And I remember that I made a promise that I have to keep. And I'm sending you down there. Moses had his, uh, his words back with God. He was a man. He said, but who am I? I, I can't talk. And then in this this conference, God said to Moses, Who made the mouth of man? Who made man to talk? Who made the deaf? Who made the dumb? And Moses still complained. He wanted to see God's glory. And he said, Moses, if you want to know who I am, I'm a miracle working God. Throw your stick down on the ground. And it turned to a serpent. Then he said, stick your hand in your bosom. And pull it out and it was leprosy. And when he put it back again and pulled it out, it was healed. Said, you know who I am, Moses? I'm the God that performs miracles. I'm the God that heals the sick and the afflicted. I am Jehovah God. Moses said, I see your glory. One more thing I want to know before this conference is closed. Who will I tell Pharaoh that sent me? He said, tell him that I am sent you. <laughs> Not I was or I will be, but forever present, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am Am is present tense. Now, it takes future presence and, and um, past tense. I am. I am has sent you. Moses received his orders and went to on down to the Egypt. Coming out, bringing the children. There come a time that when they were cornered, a people... A people called out separated people from the rest of the world. Israel was a people of God as long as in Egypt. When once out of Egypt, they were the church of God. The word called out or church means called out. So they have been called out from the rest of the world and they are the church that's what it is this morning. Those that are called out of the world. Amen. 
matter what denomination tag they have on them, if they're called out, they are separated Amen. unto God. Hallelujah. And they are members of His great church. So these people had separated themselves by offering the blood of the Lamb and by putting on the, the blood over the lintel of the door. And that was put on with hyssop. Look, I want you to notice something here. It's so striking. Moses commanded that they take hyssop and dip it into the blood of the lamb and spread it over the door. The blood, of course, represented the blood of Christ. The hyssop was common weeds. You can find it anywhere. Just pick up a handful of weeds. It shows that the blood is so simple to apply. The weeds represented faith. Just faith in God. You don't have to go somewhere else. Just take the faith of God and apply the blood to your heart. Say, I'm separated from the things of the world. Because by faith I apply the blood to my case this morning. I shall be healed because... I apply the blood Amen. over the limb of my heart. I'll never let doubt strike me again. For I'll protect myself by placing the blood of Jesus by faith, my house of, over my door, and no enemy will enter in. I'll never disbelieve God's word anymore. That's how simple it is. They were on their march at you being separated, a called out people. And they come to the Red Sea. And they had to call a halt. They couldn't cross over. The great General Joshua had to raise his hand and sound the trumpet. To stop. Quit marching. There's an obstacle before us. We have the mountains on either side. We're down here in the valley. And we have to stop. When that church ever stops, that's when Satan takes over. Got to move constantly, rapidly, marching towards Zion. Don't let the church of the living God ever be guilty of stopping. So they stopped and said, what's the matter here? And as soon as they stopped and pitched their tents, and begin to rest a while. They heard the rumble of wheels. And the only way of escape they had was backward. And here come Pharaoh's army. Moving in to block off. Or channel across. You soldiers. Knowing this strategy. How that they shut them off. There was the Red Sea before them. Perhaps two or three miles across it. Here was the high mountains. They could not climb them. They'd be like sheep scattered up there. A target for every bowman. And behind them, because they had stopped, come the enemy. It shows this, friends, even in the march today towards the promised land, the enemy's just a jump or two behind us. We can't stop at this revival. Amen. This cannot be calling a halt. Just keep moving on. Go on. You've got a presence of the Holy Spirit with you la night before last and last Hallelujah. night. Now continually move on into that. Don't call no halt. For the enemy is close behind you. And as soon as the halt was called and Pharaoh's army was uh, seen coming in the distance, uh, the roar of the wheels of the chariots and the dust flying and the screams of the soldiers. What a time! It run the people almost into a frantic. But there was one among them who knew there was no reason to be disturbed. He had had conferences before. He knowed what it had taken to get a hold of God. 
So up we'll say upon the hill at a certain rock. Moses hid himself from the rest of the children of Israel. And there he held a conference. Lord, I have marched to this place, but an obstacle has stopped us. We've had to call a halt. Like our brother here in a wheelchair. Like maybe you sitting there in it with a cancer or with a heart trouble or something that you know you're just going to die right away. The enemy has stopped you. He's brought you to a halt. Maybe you come to a halt before the enemy overtook you. Maybe it's something in your life that's caused you to halt. Whatever it is, you still have the privilege of a conference. Let's talk it over with him. Let's do something about it. No matter what the enemy is, he's never too great for our God. We need a conference. So Moses went up behind a certain place, we'll say, and held a conference with God. He didn't know what to do. Maybe you don't know what to do. Maybe you're a sinner and have done so much sin. Maybe you smoke till you can't smoke no more and can't quit it. Maybe you drink till you can't drink no more and you can't quit it. Maybe you come to the place where you so full of sin and lust that you have to look up on every woman you see wrong. Or maybe you've even perverted your own natural resources. Maybe you come to a block. I don't care where you're at. God's still ready to come to you in a conference and talk it over with you. Maybe you broke up your home. Maybe you've left your husband, left your wife. Maybe you run off from your children. There might be many things in this life that the enemy has trapped you into. But remember, my brother, sister, you still have the rights to have a conference with God. Yes, sir, talk it over with him. He's a very present help in a time of trouble. Then we see that Moses had a conference. And perhaps this was a conference. Oh, great leader of Israel. I have done all this at your command. I have, I have led these people just as you told me to do it. I've covered the people by the blood. I've brought down the plagues out of heaven. I've done everything that you told me to do. And here we are trapped. What must I do, Lord? I must have this conference with you. And perhaps sitting on top of the rock or standing near by the cliff of the rock where Moses was praying at this certain selected place in this crucial moment. Something had to be done or they'd be crushed beneath the wheels of the chariots. They'd be pushed through every little Hebrew children. Every one of the little babies that had been bursted their heads on a rock and their mothers had been cut open and, their, and ravished and their, their fathers had been massacred. That was a crucial moment. There may be that same type of crucial moment, maybe just not that way. But maybe a cancer has took a hold of you. Maybe some other disease. Maybe sin has took a hold of you. And it's going to crush you right down into a devil's hell. A separation from God. Hold a conference quickly. And when this conference was held, God stood on the rock by the side of Moses. And He said, Go back down in the camp, Moses. Go right back where you started from. I'm God. Go down there and speak to the people to go forward. Amen. I'll make the way when it comes time to make the way. Hallelujah. I'm the way making God. Moses, after the conference is over, and was dismissed from the presence of God with an order to go forward. 
Walk down and say, Fear not, Israel. Stand still this day and see the power of our God. Go towards the sea. Don't move from the commandment. The command is go forward. The promised land belongs to us. This enemy is in our way. It's got us cut off. But God said go forward. Keep moving. Hallelujah. That's what's the matter with the church today. God calls you. And He wants to give you gift after gift and power after power and grace after grace. But you organize yourself. Then I can't go any further because the church won't let me. See? There's no halting place in God. No place for denomination. There's no place for any certain standards. The thing of it is, is go forward. Speak God's Word and go forward. Just keep on going. Keep moving. God says it's right. It's right. You've got your commission. If they say, well, I went to my church and they told me I went up to that tabernacle. I'm all confused now about whether I should have the Holy Ghost or not. The promise is yours. It's to you and to your children and to them that's far off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. What? Speak the word of God. God said so. Go forward. Watch the enemy scatter. Watch the Red Sea open. Have a conference. Go forward. Sure it'll open. God is the way of escape. He made a way right straight to the promised land. Anything got in His way, He moved it out of the way. If anything gets in your way, then have a conference with God. Talk it over with Him and go on. That's what God's saying to Isaiah here. Oh, you're sinful. Your sins are like scarlet. Why don't you come and let's reason together? Why not come and talk it over with me? My grace is sufficient. The Red Sea Conference. Many years ago, there was another conference I'd like to speak just a moment of. That was the Yuletide season that we're now entering, whether there would be a Christmas or not. But there was a conference made in heaven what this plan of redemption would be. And it was decided by God that He would become a man. That he had come down and take his own curse upon himself. It would not be fair for him to send an angel. It wouldn't be fair for him to send any other person, even if he had a boy. It would not be fair for him to send his boy. It would not be fair for me to make Joseph suffer for the things of my judgment. I wouldn't be just in doing so. If I pass my judgment and want to redeem it, the only thing I can do is suffer for it myself. That's the sign. That's the death stroke to Satan. Now my Catholic brother. And also many of my Protestants. I'm not hurting you. But when you try to make Jesus a little lesser God than God. Make him a lesser God. You cut his feet off. Bring him down just a little bit under the head of God. And make him a lesser God. You are so wrong. Amen. Jesus was man. He called himself the Son of Man. That was a death blow to the devil. The devil's high. Build himself a kingdom more beautiful than Michael's. Cain, his son, wanted to make a pretty altar all out of fruits and things. God doesn't dwell in that kind of beauty. But God to strike the death blow to sin. Look how He come. How did He choose to come? There's a conference in heaven. How are you going down? How are you going to do it, Father? Said the angels. I'm going to become one of them. My law of redemption is a near kinsman. And I'll have to be man myself. That's the strike that knocks Satan. Born, he could have come down with cherubims. He could have come down the golden ladders. There could have been anthems sung through the heavens and he could have walked to the earth 
and expelled everything. But when he held the conference, he decided to come as a babe. And in Isaiah 9 and 6, we find it. Unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called the Counselor, Prince of Peace, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And out of his dominion there shall be no end. This will be a sign unto you. A babe. Not a God. A baby. Look where he was born. It had to be decided in the conference where he'd be born to make sure he was man. He was born in a stable. He chose instead of the the ivory palace guard to bring him instead of an angel escort, instead of rolling cherubims with the, with the fineries of heaven, he stuck himself, put himself in the stable over the manure of the animals, the dirt and filth of the world. He was man. He was no lesser God. He was a man. Born like we are. Through the mess of birth. Come from the womb of a woman. Not a God, a man. He was nothing. And no wonder. The greatest sign. You see in the meetings. A sign of discernment. The presence of the living God. You see the signs everywhere of Him. But let me say this to you, my brother, my sister. There never was a sign so striking as a sign that the angels told the shepherd, you'll find Him in the stable wrapped in swaddling cloth. Hallelujah. You can see what God is. That's what it startles me today. Why is it a revival can come to town of some great noted evangelist and the great up and ups go, the mayor of the city and all the up and ups are the fine dressed and the poor is kind of looked down on. And you talk about some minister who's got some great education that he can speak the most fluent words that just tickle your understanding. With great words that the poor would never understand. And you all call that great. Don't you see that God is in humility? This will be a sign the baby shall be wrapped in swaddling cloth. And be laid in a manger over the manure of the cattle and sheep. Oh my. That's a sign. This shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the baby there. Many times people think in a little old tore up tabernacle. Some preachers that already know their ABCs, gangsters and bootleggers and everything else converted. No education and use their southern expressions as he is hate and carry and tote and fetch. You'll never find God there, but that's where you find him. Wrapped in swaddling's cloth. Humility. You think it comes in some great way. If you want to hold your real conference with God, get a bunch of people like that. Then talk it over. You can see the work of God. How He didn't take some sculpture, some great artist and something and give Him an intellectual speech. But He took something that was Nothing. Come down just like he did the first place. Someone said not long ago, if this discernment and this healing and so forth was of God, the Catholic hierarchy would have it. Why didn't the Jewish hierarchy have it? It wasn't born in the palace. It was born in a stable. He didn't have needlework garments to put on, but the rags off the back of a yoke of an ox laying over a pile of manure. 
the Son of God. The tabernacle in which God lived in. That's how He decided to come. We have to have turned around collars and frock tail coats and big fine churches and golden steeples. This will be a sign. You'll find him in swatlands cloth. Wrapped in swatlands cloth and laid in the manger. There's a sign unto you. God dwells in humility. Not in pomp. That's always been the devil's idea. God comes in humility. That'll be a sign. Not a lesser God, but a man. A man. He cried like a baby when he was a baby. He played in the streets like a boy when he was a boy. He worked in the carpenter shop with Joseph as a man at work. He eat when he was hungry. He sweated when he was hot. He cried when he was sorrowful. He was a man. This will be a sign to you. God will dwell with you. And a humble, not a great big up to up man, but a little low man with no background. A sign. That's a death stroke to the devil right there. That's a death stroke to every denomination and pomp and all pomp and glory of this world. It's a death stroke that the God of heaven chose to come that way. That's what happened at the conference. It had to be decided. That's the way He chose to come. He didn't have to come that way. He was a God of heaven. But He chose to come as a baby. He chose to come that way. That's what happened at the conference in heaven. Let me just call another or two conferences. Let me call this one. There was a time after a perfect life of 33 and a half years had been lived. A man who wanted to live as much as I want to live. As much as you want to live. A man who had something to live for. Brother that he loved. People that he loved. Sunsets that he liked to see. Remember, Jesus was a man. God was in him. There come a time where the spirit that was leading the lamb, the dove. There had to be a conference between the lamb and the dove. And they formed a place to sit it. After the supper that night, they crossed over a little brook, Cedrath, and, or somewhere, and went across the brook and went into a garden called Gethsemane. They had to have a conference. God in Christ had to talk it over. The lamb and the dove had to set together. It was the dove that had to talk to the lamb and it was the lamb's death. Now when they sat by that rock, all the angels come down from heaven to listen into this conference. Oh, there was Gabriel, Michael, Woodworm, all the thousands of them sitting around the rock. He said to his disciples, wearied. They'd had lots of big meetings, just tired perhaps like you are this morning. But he said, will you just watch with me an hour? For well, I've got to go yonder and have a conference. I have to go alone. And when they, the conference was set, and the lamb young, a beautiful life, Never a life like that. Never was, never will be. A life like that the Lamb had. But now the Father said, Are you willing? Is your love for your brethren great enough? Is your love for that sinful, staking world that you were born in? Do you love them enough to forfeit your life? Do you love them enough to take their place, to bear their sins to the hardest, crucial death? You, there could be nothing die that kind of death but Him. And in that conference, such a decision was made until blood dropped from His brow. He was under a strain. The sins of the world was upon Him. 
And then he looked into the face of the dove and said, Not my will, but thy will be done. Oh, can we have that decision in our hearts this morning? Can you forfeit that little filthy life of yours? Are you willing to look into His face and say, Not my will. I'm a drunkard, but I'll drink no more. I'm a gambler, I'll drink no more. I'm immoral, but I'll be that way no more. I'm a liar, but I'll stop it today. I'm a foul person. But in this conference this morning, I'll look into your face and take like my master who died for me to make my way clear. Not my will. Your will. If it costs me my home, if it costs me my husband, my wife, my father, my mother, my fellowship, my church membership, whatever it costs me. In this conference this morning, I say I want your Holy Spirit to live in me. I've heard about it. I want you in me. Not mine, but yours. That's my decision. God's called the place, not upon some high pinnacle place, but a humble little tabernacle about to fall in. We're having a conference. Let me speak of one more conference here just a moment. Many could be taught up. There was a conference after his death, burial, and resurrection. Something had to be done. They were man that had an intellectual conception. So there was another great conference set. We know it in the Bible as Pentecost. They had to have a conference. And something had to be done for Jesus said, Don't preach no more. Don't sing anymore. Don't go out and minister anymore. But I want a conference with you. And in this conference, I'm going to bring the Holy Spirit. But go up to the city of Jerusalem. And there you wait until I get back. I've got to go up to heaven to let them rejoice. And I've got to go up to the, the throne of the majesty, the body, Jesus. But I'm going, we're going to have a conference up there. And the God that dwells in me has promised that I could return back again. And I'd be in you. With you, in you, even to the end of the consummation, the world. Until it's all over, I'll be with you. And the works that I do, will you do also. So they didn't know how they'd ever do this, so they went to Pentecost. And 120 went in the upper room and closed the door. And they waited and they waited. The trouble with us, if we don't get a... An audience with God in about ten minutes we're tired, our knees are hurting. We want to leave. If He doesn't answer us just according to what we want, the way we think, we're disgusted with Him. Oh, come let us reason together. Go up to Pentecost. I want to reason it with you. Just go up there and wait. Ten days they'd been sitting, standing, praying, everything, waiting for the promise. And all of a sudden, the results of the conference in heaven came down. The Holy Ghost like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. And they went forward preaching the Word. When we have world conferences, they usually have their selected place. And what do they do at this conference? They drink drinks, cocktails. They smoke cigars and cigarettes. They lie to one another and deceive one another. And peace talks of the world. But when God calls a conference, it's fasting, Amen. cleaning up, Amen. prayer. Amen. Receiving orders and going forward. Amen. That's God's comforts. Not feasting, but fasting. Amen. Not indulging in filth, 
but separating, cleansing yourself from all unrighteousness when you go before God. Cleaning yourself by faith to applying the house of, to the blood and cleansing your heart and walking before God for a conference. That's the kind of conferences when you meet with God. Then God gives you orders. Then you go forward. He goes with you. There's many great conferences we could think of, but the time won't permit. There's been a conference lately. There was a conference in the days of Martin Luther at the Reformation. God called Martin Luther to go preach justification, and he did it. There was a conference held in the days of Wesley in England to preach sanctification. And as Wesley testified, I wore his coat, the last coat he had on, a robe. I stood in his pulpit where he preached at 1500 every morning at 5 o'clock. Knelt in the room and thanked God for his life, the very room that he died in. In there. The Spirit upon me, I thought, yes, Wesley was true. God's holy angels and God held a conference that it was time to preach sanctification. And they selected Wesley. And he was true to it. Then along come the Pentecostal. It was time for a Pentecostal restoration. There was a conference held in heaven. Is it time to pour out the fullness of the Spirit? And it fell. And they preached it. And we got it. And received the Holy Ghost. Now, I believe that we're at another conference. That's the coming of the Son of God. He said to His disciples, I do not know the minute or hour. No one knows, not even the angels, but there will be a conference someday and otherwise. And the Father will decide that moment and I'll come back. I believe that conference is going on. The decisions is being made. His Spirit is coming to the earth so strong till it will stand in the congregation to discern the thoughts of the mind. As the Bible said, the Word of God is quicker, more powerful than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the mire of the bone, and a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. When Philip come and was converted and went and got Nathaniel, and Nathaniel was brought the Jew up before Jesus, and he had been telling him about him, say, well, Nathaniel, well, a few days ago, an old ignorant fisherman come to him, and he knowed, he called his name. Told him who he was. Don't you know that Messiah that our prophets said would come? Don't you realize that that Messiah was to be a prophet? A God prophet? There he is. That's him. Nathaniel must have said, I don't believe that. I'll go see for myself. But when he walked into the presence of Jesus, Jesus said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And when he did that, he said, when did you know me, Rabbi? I said, before Philip called you, when you were on the tree, I saw you. He said, you are the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. When the woman of Samaria, having five husbands, come to him. And she said, when she started to get her water, she seen this Jew sitting. He said, bring me a drink. See, he thirsted like a man. He was a man. In his body, he was a man. In spirit, he was God. God dwelt in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself. He said, bring me a drink. She said, well, it's not customary. In other words, we got a segregation. You shouldn't ask me that. He said, but if you only knew who you were talking to. Oh, I wonder this morning, if we know what's in this room, if we only knew that the Holy Spirit Himself, the one that will witness for us or against us at the day of judgment right here in the room and knows our thoughts. If you only knew who it was that speaks with you, you'd ask me for a drink. She said, the well's deep. He kept on talking to her until he caught her spirit. And he said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I have none. He said, you said, well, you've had five. And the one that you're now living with is not your husband. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now we know when the Messiah cometh, he'll do these things. But who are you? Jesus said, I'm he. Oh my. 
I'm He that speaks with you. A mere man asking for a drink. Not a great flowery something out of heaven. Not the white throne sitting there. But a man asking for a drink of water to quench his thirst. I'm He that speaks with you. And she ran into the city and said, Come see a man who's told me the things I've done. Isn't that the sign of the Messiah? Isn't that he? That same one prophesied with the prophets back in the Old Testament. Said, It'll be a day that when they'll otherwise just join church and go to church and be pretty good people. And they'll have organizations and things. And it'll be a dismal day. Neither dark nor light. But in the evening time, it shall be light. Them prophecies must be fulfilled. Amen. You remember last night our conference in heaven? God had brought up all the angels around to hold a conference so He could make the prophet's word come to pass. Bring Elijah, I mean Ahab out there to kill him. Now, there's a conference going on in heaven. Amen. The evening lights are here. Amen. Atomic bombs and things are hanging everywhere. And we're at the end time. World conferences has come to an end. God's conference time is coming. Amen. These words must be fulfilled to the Gentiles. The works that I do shall you do also. Amen. The time is here. The conference has been held. The Spirit is here. Now, friend, in closing, I say this. You're at a conference this morning. You are. And your case is ready to be pleaded. Your, your case of sickness is ready to be pleaded. Before a merciful God. Your sin case is ready to be pleaded. Before a merciful God. And be sure that you accept it. For let me tell you, I'm going to speak of the last conference that will ever be held. God be merciful. Only one thing will stand there reconciled. That's the judgment. And the only thing you'll be reconciled by is when you've accepted the blood of Jesus Christ as your pardon. Been filled with His Spirit. There's a conference where every man will meet. Every woman will meet. Every child will meet. There is a place selected where that conference will be held. And there will be a great white throne judgment set. God has permitted His prophets to look in and said the books were open and another book which is a book of life. Ten thousands times ten thousands of ministers and angels ministered to Him. And then it was written, If the righteous be scarcely saved, where will the sinner and ungodly appear? What will be your stand at that conference? You might have bypassed all of them down through your life. You may walk out of this door this morning and bypass this one. But my friend, you'll never bypass that one. You are going to be there. For it was once appointed unto man to die. But after that, the judgment. There will be the great conference where we'll all stand together. And we'll give an account for this morning of this earthly conference that we've held this morning. If you are a sinner, accept His mercy while we pray as you bow your heads. Just before we pray in you with your heads bound, I wonder this morning, sitting in this conference, if the Holy Spirit hasn't said to you, you're guilty. And maybe you say, Holy Spirit, you see, it's like this. That's what Moses said at the Red Sea Conference. It's like this, Lord. I've come this far, but I can't go any farther. There's something in my way. There may be something in your way. But remember, God told Moses, go speak to the children of Israel and go forward. You'd like to be remembered in a word of prayer, would you just raise your hands and say, Pray for me, brother? God bless you. Mile all over the building. <laughs> Dozens of hands. Heavenly Father, 
with this broken voice, rather shattered from preaching, but somehow or another the great Holy Spirit has given the people the thought that was meant. When the prophet said, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Now come, let us hold a conference with each other right in the seat where we're sitting. I'm sitting here by the side of you. I'm talking to you. But Lord, I've sinned, says the sinner. I've done so much. I don't believe you can forgive me, Lord. I'm a drunkard. I'm a prostitute. I'm a, oh, an ill-famed person. I don't believe, Lord, there'd be any chance for me. Then we hear the beautiful words come back, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white like snow. Though they be red like crimson, taking the life of many little babies before they're born, and, and things that's been horrible. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as the wool of a lamb. What mercy! Let us reason together, saith God now. Let us come hold this conference, Lord, and you're speaking to your people. They raise their hands. That shows that you're sitting by them. For it's written in the Scripture, No man can come to me except my Father draws him first. And all that the Father gives me will come to me, and I'll give them everlasting life and raise them up at the last day. Now grant, Lord, that each one that raised their hands and those who did not raise their hands, wherever your little individual conferences are being held in this building just now with the people, may they accept your pardoning grace and be filled with your Spirit and washed in your blood. And at the end of the road, may you say it as well done, my good faithful servant, you were faithful that morning at 8th and Penn Street. Now enter into the joys of the Lord that's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. Lord, my God and my Father, I commit them to you. I can do no more. I'm just your preacher. And I can do no more. They're yours. Deal with them, Father, according to their needs of their heart. We permit them or commit them to Thee. In the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have ever noticed at the tabernacle, I do not permit people to go pull people to an altar. I don't believe in that. If God don't bring you... It won't do no good for somebody else to. No man can come except my Father draws him, and all that the Father and the Father draws you because your name's on the Lamb Book of Life. And all that He has given me will come to me. Whether you're in your seat at the altar, wherever you're at, you'll come. That's exactly true. Jesus said so. So now, you dear people, it raised your hand. The next step for you to take if you haven't been baptized is to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of your sins. That's the doctor's prescription. Dr. Simon Peter, who had the keys to the kingdom to tell you how to enter. On the day of Pentecost, they said, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent, every one of you. That's what you've just done. Then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. To show to the people in the world that you believe death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, He took your sins. Then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children. To them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Follow that instruction. If it's not at this tabernacle, at the tabernacle where you go to, the church where you go to, wherever it is. Don't stay out. Get right quick to a body of spiritual believers. 
Go to the assemblies of God, the church of God, the Pentecostal oneness, the Pentecostal two-ness, three-ness, whatever it might be. I don't care where you go, but get quickly to a church. Amen. Put your fellowship in there. If they teach little things, maybe you don't, you don't say, well, Brother Brandon didn't teach it like that. Well, don't make any difference anyhow. If you've got the Holy Ghost, move on. Get with them. Push on. We're, we're all going to come to one anyhow. When Solomon's temple was cut out across the world, it was cut from all over the world. Different funny looking stones and everything else. But when they began to come together, there wasn't a buzz of a saw or sound of a hammer. Forty years in the erecting of the temple, they never heard one hammer beat or one saw buzz. They were all cut out just right. All these great churches that's got the Holy Spirit will move right together in their fitted places at that day in the body of Christ for the rapture. So just get to where they believe the gospel. Now, my precious friends, I didn't know it. I took that much of your time. I don't know what time I come on. Was it 9.30 or 10 o'clock or something? 10 o'clock? I can't. Is it that really that long? I couldn't hardly believe it. We have time for just a prayer for the sick. We promised them that. Now, just one minute. If you'll just give us... 15 minutes. Just, uh, I believe it's 15 minutes till, so we'll just take that 15 minutes by my watch. Listen, there is nothing. Your first duty when you get sick, of course, you go to your doctor. He does all he can do. If he can't do no more, you have a right to go to the great specialist then. Uh, we're not against doctors. I have many precious doctor friends who are my buddies Fine man who believe in God and I pray for them and they even pray for me. That's right. They get a patient they can't do nothing with. Many fine doctors. Of course, I hold back their name. Maybe they're not filled with the Holy Ghost and things, but they're a good man. They say, Brother Bram, there's nothing I can do with that case if you'll take it. I say, send it over. Let me, I can't do it. I'll permit it to Jesus, commit it to Jesus Christ. Let Him do it. See? So, that's fine. But look, if there is ever any healing takes place, Christ will be the one that does it. Amen. The doctor can move an obstruction, pull a tooth, or, um, or uh, cut a place off, take appendix out, take, cut a cancer off, cut a wart off, or operate for something else, put poison in you to kill germs. But there's nothing can heal besides God because it has to be a creation to grow it back. And no medicine will create. See, there's only one creator. That's God. Then Psalms 103. See, all the scriptures are true. I'm the Lord who heals all of your diseases. Now, I don't say the doctor hasn't got a part in it. Yes, he has. If I break my arm, my duty is to go to a doctor that knows how to set that arm. But he can't heal that arm. He can only set it, place the bones back in a place. And then God furnishes the calcium and so forth. And creates the, the material that inside my arm that grows it back together. God's the healer. See, Now, we've been preaching this week. The Jewish custom for people in the Jewish time was to go lay hands on the sick. That's what they did. Everything was laying on of hands. It was a Jewish order. But it never was that way with the Gentiles. Never. When Jairus' daughter, a Jewish priest... When she died, he said to Jesus, Come lay your hands on my child and she'll live. Lay your hands on it. But when he went to the Roman centurion, he said, I'm not worthy. You come under my house. Stand out there where you are and just speak the word. He realized the authority that Jesus had. He said, I'm a man under authority. I've got a, he's a centurion. I a mean, a hundred men under him. He said, if I say to this man, do this, he does it. And that man, do that, he does it. He said, and you have the authority over every disease and every affliction and everything. They're all at your command. You're the great commander. Oh, I like that. That even touched the heart of Jesus. And he turned around to them, to the Jewish people. And he said, I've not found faith like that in Israel. The Seraphiopian woman, a Gentile Greek, come to him and said, Lord, I've got a child laying down here that the devil is variously bothering her. She probably is an epileptic or some type of insanity. Said she's in a terrible shape. Would you heal her? And he tried her faith. 
Why he said it's not meat to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. Calling her a dog. And in them days, a dog was one of the, about like a hog, the lowest thing there was. Said it's not meat for me to take the children's bread and give it to you dogs. She said, that's the truth, Lord. Oh, I like that. That's the truth. Said, but you know, the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. That touched him. She said, like you did the other day, Hattie, the right thing. He turned and he said, for this saying, the devil's left your daughter. Didn't have to go to her and lay hands on her. At the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost fell, Philip went out to Samaria. They were half Jews. So when he went out, he had to lay hands on them to receive the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost hadn't come up on none of them yet. So they sent up and got Peter. They'd been baptized in the name of Jesus. So they went up and got Peter and John at Jerusalem at the headquarters. And they come down and laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Then Peter went up to the house of Cornelius. See, so he had to lay hands on them. Look, Acts 19, when that bunch of Jews at Ephesus, he had to lay hands on them that they received the Holy Ghost. But while he's at Cornelius' house, while he spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them. Amen. Amen. No laying on of hands. The Holy Ghost fell when they heard the truth. They were hungry and waiting for it. Are you that hungry for healing this morning? Then let the Holy Spirit speak. Amen. If Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, you believe that? Amen. Did He say the works that I do shall you also? How did He declare Himself to the people to be their Messiah, the Jews' Messiah? How did He do it to the Jews? By telling them the secret of their heart. They recognized Him the Messiah. How many knows that's true? Sure. When the Peter come and he said, Your name is Peter. And said, or your name is Cephas. Said, you'll be called Peter. Your father's name was Jonas. That settled it. He knew that was the Messiah. When Philip went and found Nathaniel, he said, you're a, you're a good, honest man. He said, now, Rabbi, when did you know me? He said, before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. Fifteen miles around the mountains a day's journey, I saw you. He said, you're the Son of God, the King of Israel. He went down to the Samaritans. He had need go by. Why? He went down to the Samaritans. And there was a Samaritan woman. And so he thought he'd just give her the sign of the Messiah. And he said, go get your husband and come here. She said, I have no husband. He said, you said, well, because you've got five. She said, sir. In other words, like this, we've been looking for a Messiah to come. And he's going to be a God prophet. And we know when He comes, He'll tell us these things. So you must be some sort of a prophet. He said, I'm the Messiah. I'm He that you're speaking of. She left that water pot, a prostitute and desperate. How conditioned she was in running to the city and said to those men, come see a man who told me what's in my heart. Isn't that the Messiah? Isn't that the Messiah? Not one time was it ever done to the Gentiles. No, sir. This is their day when the evening lights. The Jews aren't a nation now to control the world. One time they did. They're coming back. Watch that fig tree putting forth its buds yonder. You watch the Jew, wherever he is, God's calendar, you'll find out he'll never forsake Israel. Amen. But Israel had to be blinded. I'm not saying this in behalf of this Jewish sitting here. But Israel had to be blinded in order to give us a chance. Yeah. We love them. Don't you worry. They'll blossom again. What the palmer worm left the caterpillar eating. What the caterpillar left as a locust eating. But I will restore, saith the Lord. That was just eating for a spell so that we could be brought in. Our eyes are open. Now what is it? Our day is ending. The Jews are beginning to assemble again together like God said. And the evening lights is shining on what? Where's the lights in the evening shine? On the west. They shine on the east at the Jews, the eastern people, at the beginning. It's been a dark day of denominations and so forth. But the evening lights shall shine on the Gentiles, the western hemisphere. Here we are now. At the end, we're, we're at the west coast. If you go any farther, you're going back east again. Civilizations travel that way. So the evening lights are shining.
Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let us pray. Now, Lord, these are all yours. Word, faith cometh by hearing. Hearing the Word of God. And God, you make your words manifested to prove to the people that you are God. Now, let it be known this morning that you are God and I am your servant, telling them the truth of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. I believe Billy told me out there that there was a, a great bunch of prayer cards. Many people here. We cannot bring all of them up, you know that. Far to, far to prove that, or just that you might see. Now, God don't have to do this. Any, everyone know that? Jesus didn't have to heal anybody when He was on earth. Did you know that? But He did it that it might be fulfilled which is spoken by the prophet. Is that right? He does this that the word might be fulfilled as it was in the days of Sodom. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. You notice they had Billy Graham and Old Robert Sam in the day of Sodom. Man like them went down and preached to the Sodomites in the city. But the elect Abraham and his group was a called out group out to one side. What kind of an angel stayed behind and preached to them? Watch. The man sat there said he was a stranger from a foreign country. Dust on his clothes. Had just eat part of a calf. Drank the milk from the mother. Eat some corn cakes with Abraham while perhaps he had the fly bush shooing the flies away while he was doing it. Sitting there eating. And after he had left, Abraham called him Elohim. The Almighty. But he was a man. God in his people. Now, look what he did, how he knew it. He sat there and talked to Abraham. He said, now the first time he had met Abraham. First time Abraham had seen him knowingly. And these other men was going to go on into Sodom. And they went out there and preached and blinded the people. Isn't that what the preaching of the gospel does? Blinds the unbeliever? Notice. But this one stood back there with the elect church. Abraham and his group. The circumcised. The real ones. He said uh, Lot was a... The one that lives in the city and has big times and see how his daughters was and how his sons was and everything. That's just like the world today. Sodom, sin and everything. That's the church nominal. But the church spiritual is a called out group. Separated. What kind of an angel come to them? Now let's watch it. Now remember, your Lord said, as it was then, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus said, so heavens and earth will pass away, but my words will never fail. Now listen close and be quiet. Now, this angels talked to Abraham. He said, Abraham, where is your wife Sarah? How did he know he was married? How did he know he had a wife? And how did he know her name was Sarah? Strange, wasn't it? And Abraham said, she's in the tent behind you. He said, Abraham, seeing that that you believe God and you're going to be heir to the world. All the Gentiles and all will be brought into the kingdom by your seed. By your, the promises made to you. I'll not keep any pro, anything hid from you, Abraham. Oh, I love that. I won't hide this from you, Abraham. But you believe me for that baby for 25 years. Now you're 100 years old and she's 90. But Abraham, according to the time of life, in a mixed audience, you know what I mean. The 28 days. She'd stop 50 years or more. Yeah, 60 years before that. Said, according to the time of life with Sarah, I'm going to visit you again. And you're going to bring that baby. And Sarah, behind him, in the tent, flaps closed, laughed within herself. Yes. And said in herself, could I have pleasure with my Lord? What do you call your husband? Will I have pleasure with my Lord again, seeing that I'm old and he's old too? And the angel with his back turned said, Why did Sarah laugh? What made her laugh? Don't you see? What kind of a spirit, what kind of an angel was that of visiting that elect church there? Now Jesus said that same thing will take place 
just before His coming. That will be a sign of His coming. Let's call a prayer line. He made the promise. He keeps it. Now there's somewhere along there. I've got to call up five or six people. As many can stand here. The rest of you all just believe. Watch. If you don't have a prayer card and get up here, that don't mean one thing. I challenge you. Here's what, here's what the seed of Abraham did Jesus when he was on earth. One day, he was passing through a crowd of people. And all of them were saying, Hello, Rabbi. Good morning, Doctor. How are you, Reverend? Glad to meet you, Reverend. Glad to have you over here. Go to hold a meeting while we're over here. And a poor little woman had a need. So she slipped through the crowd and she touched his garment. For she said within herself, If I'll just touch that holy man. Her faith. faith. If I touch him, I'll be made well. So she touched him and she went back out in the crowd. She said, oh, I'm sure I'm healed because I believe that. I believed it. I know I'm healed. I, I just believe the blood issue is stopping right now. I just believe it. Jesus stopped and said, Say, who touched me? What a question. Peter said, in other words, Lord, what's the matter with you? The Bible said he rebuked him. I said, what do you mean by that? Why, everybody's touching that. How do you come to say you being the Messiah? Aren't you afraid you're going to dispose yourself here before these people? Who touched me? And I bet there's been 500 touching the last minute. Why would you say such a thing as that? He said, but this was a different touch. I perceived that I got weak. Virtue. Anyone knows virtue strength. I got weak. Strength went out of me. And he looked around. Looked around. See this faith out there somewhere. He looked around. And he found the little woman. The Holy Spirit, where there was in him in the fullness, directed him right to the little woman. That blood issue she had had, he said, your faith, now I never healed you. I never had nothing to do with it. But your faith in who, and God, who I'm representing, your faith has made you whole. Now, the Bible said that He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the same in principle, the same in power, the same in attitude, the same God that lived in Christ lives in the church. Not as much of it. He had without measure. We have it by measure. But if you had a spoonful of water out of the ocean, the same chemicals as in the whole ocean is in the spoonful. Remember that. That's right. It's the same God. Now, the Bible said in Hebrews, He said that Jesus Christ right now is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. How many knows that? Well, if he is the same high priest, wouldn't he act the same way if he was touched? Yeah. What are we? His mouthpiece. Yeah. We submit ourselves to him, and our words are not our words. Take no thought what you shall say, because it's not you that speaks. It's the Father that dwelleth in you. He speaks. <laughs> Somewhere. Or was that, Billy? One to fifty or one to a hundred? One to a hundred. Usually people rally for that first card, so we'll leave that alone for a minute. Let's start at a funny number. Let's say 30. Who has prayer card 30? Raise up your hand. What's, what's the letter? B. B30. All right? Look in your pockets. Pull out your prayer card. And if there, well, there's, if there's no 30, well, we'll start somewhere else and we'll, we'll begin it. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. Come here, sir. 31. Who has prayer card 31? Would you raise up your hand? 31. Come right here, sir. 32. Who has prayer card 32? You, young lady? 33. Who has prayer card 33? Would you raise your hand? This lady here. All right, sister. 33. 34, the prayer card 34, you sir, 35, 36, 36, who has prayer card 36, did I miss it, you have 36, young lady, 37, this lady was confused here, find out, what's your prayer card number, see where she's at, 35, I'm sorry lady, or right, get your place, uh, the boys there will place you where you're to be. 37, 38, 39, 40. Let's see them raise up. There's three now. 
I guess that's it. 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. Let them prayer cards come forth. Prayer card up to 45, from 30 to 45. Now, if you can't get up, have you a prayer card, sir? Do you? I don't see but one crippled man. He's sitting here in a wheelchair. Now, if there's anyone without any of them prayer cards, now we don't know. I guess I'm getting a jam there. So <laughs> okay. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll stop it just a minute. All right. We don't have no room here, see, to have it done orderly. Now, how many in here does not have a prayer card, and yet you're sick, and you want God to heal you? Raise your hand. Well, it's practically everywhere. I suppose, just about everywhere. All right. Now, I'm going to ask you, if you will, for these next few minutes, which I've took over my time now, but here is the showdown, whether this word's right or not. Amen. This proves it. Now, let me have your undivided attention. Anyone here knows that if I could, I'd heal every one of you. But the Bible said that I'm the Lord thy God who heals all thy diseases. It's based upon a faith. All these things I've preached this week, up to this time, and down through my life has been based upon the finished works of Christ at Calvary. If you believe it, that's all God asks. If you believe it, you should have what you ask for. Now, as far as signs and wonders to appear, He promised that. First, He said in the church what? Apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors. That's God's order set in the church to perfect the saints. Now, I want each one of you to give me your undivided attention. Now, there's just about one person in that prayer line that I think that I know, and that's the man with the white suit on. I can't call his name, but I, I believe he's from somewhere about the, up around Carolina or something. He's a car dealer or something. I've had wor uh, words with him. I don't even know his name, but I, and frankly, I, I don't know what's the matter with him. I, God knows that. I couldn't tell you what's wrong with him. But I think the rest of them are all strangers to me. I don't know them. How many out here that knows I don't know nothing about you? Raise your hands. Now, the Bible said when the Holy Spirit has come, He'll, first thing the Holy Spirit would do what? Reveal these things to you that I've taught. Is that right? Then what would He do? Show you things to come. Uh, be a revealer of the secret of the heart. He would do the same work that Jesus did. Now, how many believe that Jesus completed the plan of salvation and healing at Calvary? Yeah. Certainly. So as far as that, it's all over, isn't it? It's all over. But the only thing that He can do is to shock you or to bring you to an understanding that He's still God and keeps His promise. So in doing so, He anoints preachers. That's these fine men standing around here and many back there. He anoints them to preach. I'm a poor substitute for a preacher. He give me this for my preaching, you see. Instead, because I'm uneducated and don't know nothing, and, uh, and you know what I mean, to be a scholar or anything or a student. But he give these men opportunities to do that. And they get up there under inspiration and preach. Oh, they could say more in five minutes than I could say in an hour. Because under the inspiration, it's like a cannon or a machine gun rapidly driving it right down like a trip hammer driving. See? Be, see, my gift is something else. I have to take my time and study what, wait and see what the Holy Spirit tell me next. And See, it's not exactly in my line. But yet I do it in order to build a congregation to let them know what my conception is of Christ. Usually in the meetings, I have some good preacher to preach for me. But now, now is the time. This is the hour. And if the word's been preached, then what about it? If it's just preached and you walk away, well, you don't know it. But if he comes around and proves that what he said is the truth, then, brother, it's on your lap then. Amen. That's right. It's you. Now, if the Holy Spirit will come this morning in the audience and do exactly the way he did when he was in Jesus Christ, 
How many of you will believe that God was once over us, then with us in Christ, now in us in the church? Sure. Now, if you can see now, you don't have to have hands laid on you. If you're a real believer, why Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them. Yeah, yeah. I do not need to come lay hands on my servant. Just say the word, and that's all you have to do. See whether you're seed of Abraham now. Let God do the rest. Heavenly Father, as a man, as a servant, that's my finished word. You speak from here after, Lord. Let it be so that they'll know that you're God in the midst of the people. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the man is the man, just like, uh, well, I'd say that when Nathaniel came before Jesus, as far as I know, we've never met. We're strangers to one another. But God knows the man. I do not know him. In my memory, I've never saw him unless it just happened to be on the street somewhere and met him out here, shook his hand, or said, how did you sir, or something other than mine. all I know. But God knows the man. Now, if uh, uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then you have if this man is sick, then as far as healing, he's already done it. Jesus has already finished that. But just some way to get him believed to know that Jesus is right here. Now, what did Jesus say? The sign, like was at Sodom, so will be done in the last days. The works that I do, showing that he was that very same one that was with Abraham. Before Abraham was, I am. He was that angel. Here he, here he is here this morning, the same angel dwelling in us. Now, the man may be a, an imposter. He may be a hypocrite. He may be an infidel. He may be a, a saint. He, I don't know nothing about him. He's just standing there. But if the Holy Spirit will come and reveal to him, let him be the judge from then on. He knows. If the Holy Spirit can tell him what has been in his life, surely, he, if that's true, he could believe what will be in his life. Is that right? If he could tell what has been, what about what will be? Now, he'll know whether it's right or not, whether it has been. Doctor, you believe this. You and mother both. You believe it. And the other doctor sitting back there also from Springfield, Missouri. See, the Holy Spirit's in here now. Gray-headed man there. Stand out the Ablin Motel out here. You're suffering with something in your side. You're not from here to begin with. You're from Canada. Yes. That's British Columbia. That's right. Vancouver. That's right. You come from Finland. Yes. Kitas. Kitas. God bless you. Go home. You're well. Jesus Christ makes you well. You believe? I don't know the man. I don't know now what I said to him. That was the Holy Spirit speaking. Another stranger. I don't know the man, never seen him in my life. I suppose we're strangers. Is that right, right sir? That's right. I've never seen the man, know nothing about him. I'd be real reverent. And if I don't know nothing about the man, and the Lord will tell me something about him, then surely that would confirm that it takes something more than man to do that. Is that right? Now, if you just be real reverent and watch and be careful, and when the Holy Spirit brays over you like that, accept it. Believe it with all your heart. A stranger. First thing, you're seeking salvation. You're an alcoholic. That's right. That's exactly. That's right. You're not from this city. You come from another city. Indiana City. I believe it's Newcastle, something like that. Newcastle. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You're with somehow or another. I see somebody. You're with a woman. It's a connected. Where's Lyle Woods? 
It's his wife. That's right. She's here now. That's right. She wants to be prayed for too. Yes, sir. You believe God can tell me what your trouble is? Yes, sir. Heart trouble. She believe with all of her heart, she can be healed. I condemn that devil in you that makes you drink alcohol. Go home in the name of Jesus Christ and never drink it again. Be baptized in His precious name, taking away the sins, and I condemn the devil. May he pass from it. Amen. Go on. God bless you, sir. Hallelujah. Your sins are forgiven now. Go and sin no more. Amen. Have faith in God. Don't doubt. Believe with all that is in you. Hallelujah. We're strangers to one another, young lady. You believe Christ knows us both here is like the woman at the well and our Savior. You're not her, neither am I he, but his spirit lives forever. The woman, this young woman standing here has, if you could see it, between her and I is a, this light of the angel standing here. But just beyond that is a shadow. And that shadow is death. Darkness, it's a cancer. The cancer is located at rectum. You're not from this country either. You're from Kentucky. From LaGrange, Kentucky. That's right. Ms. Johnson, hey, what if you believe with all your heart, go back home and Jesus Christ make you well. Do you believe that? I condemn the devil that's taken the life of this woman. On the basis of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I now challenge Satan and tell him that he is a defeated being, that Jesus Christ defeated him at Calvary, and as God's servant under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that... The commission given me by an angel, I condemn this devil for this woman's life. Let her live, O oh Lord. Amen. Return home, rejoice, and be happy. Thanking the Lord. Don't doubt now. Don't have a doubt in your mind. You look awfully sincere and innocent about that lady. If you believe that gland trouble you're suffering with, arthritis, believe it with all your heart, it'll leave you. Now, the little lady felt something right here because there's a spirit between both of them, you see. You, yours is all right, too. Just believe with all your heart. And by the way, the little lady next to her there, Yes, that's you. <laughs> Sitting there looking up praying. Uh -huh. That back trouble, believe with all your light, heart. And you too, you had a back trouble also. So just go up and go home now. Be well. You believe? All your heart? You're here for your daughter. Your daughter is shattered with death. It's a cancer. And her spiritual conditions is not too good. That's right. Yes, sir. She's just up and down, in and out, washed around. You see that handkerchief you got in your hand? Yes, sir. You believe that's the Holy Spirit speaking here. Let me have that handkerchief. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, I condemn the condition of her daughter. On the words of her mother, may it be effective upon her in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, don't doubt. Have faith. She can go home now. Put that handkerchief on her. Believe. Have faith in God. There's a woman, if you can see her, she's got her eyes closed, her hands up praying. Wiping her eyes. You touched something, sister. You didn't touch me. But you touched him. Now you've got varicose veins, female trouble, 
Complications of all kinds. That is right, isn't it? Raise your hand if that's true. All right. Now go home and be made well. What did she touch? I want to ask you, what did that woman touch? The high priest. Can you recognize Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is present? If thou canst believe. The spirits in the audience be believing. That pillar of fire that is on this picture here is moving in the audience. It's a woman looking right at me. It stands over her. Hands up like this with a handkerchief in her mouth. Got trouble with the head. Kind of a nerve condition of the head. That is right. Do you believe me to be his prophet? You believe that to be Christ talking to you? Go home. You're going to get over it. Believe with all your heart. Man sitting right behind her there. Something her connected with him about Camelsville, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. You got a nerve trouble too. Prostrate, high blood. You believe with all your heart, sir? If you do, raise up your hand if those things are right. What did you touch? You touched somebody, the high priest. Go believe and get well. Here's a woman, kind of heavy set, sitting here with her hand up around her. I believe I know that woman. I've seen her somewhere. <coughs> she's praying. She's got trouble with her head. And immediately when I said head to that other woman just a few minutes ago, it affected her. She's got a head trouble too. I've seen the woman somewhere. I can't place her. But I've seen her. Oh, yes, I do. I know now, even spiritually, she's Rose Austin. From Louisville, Kentucky. Believe now. Go home, be well. I know you. I know your I know your face. I was with you in a, a interview in a trailer where you received the Holy Ghost. That's right. Laid hands upon you. You received I don't know what your name is right now, but I know you you have a car business. That's all I know. I have no idea what's wrong with you. You you're aware of that. That's right. No idea. If God will reveal what the trouble is, then the same one that gave you the Holy Ghost can heal you, give you the desire of your heart. Believe that? Yes, sir. You're not here for yourself. It's not your condition. It's for a loved one. It's a sister in Virginia. Some kind of a trouble like a back. Your wife's sitting there. She's also needy. She believes the old heart trouble and things will just leave her and she This woman that's right here is connected with you. That's your mother. She's bothered about whether she has the Holy Ghost or not. Also, she has a bladder trouble that's bothering her. And something other, the doctor, that kind of a strong fellow said, it's a fallen moon. You're supposed to be operated on some time ago. He was the cause of you not being operated on. He wants you to come here and be prayed for. The one standing right behind her is some relation. That young woman is relation somehow. But she's only by marriage. A niece by marriage. She's bothered about her salvation too. That's right. And she's got diabetes, a young woman. Exactly true. You believe? Let's just raise our hands to God. O oh Lord, creator of heavens and earth, author of life, giver of every good gift, send thy presence into the midst of the people now. Give to them the desire of their hearts, Lord. We thank you for this, praying that you'll just bless and give these people what they have need of. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. How many believes? I don't remember. But somehow it went on this line on somebody. Was it all true? Raise your hands. Everyone who talked to you, was it true? All true. Then it's true that the Holy Spirit is here. Is that true? Now believe me as His servant. I know that you're restless, you're tired. See? Don't doubt. 
believe now that this is Him. That rushing wind that came on the day of Pentecost in the upper room, that's the same thing that affected these people when that taken place because it's the same Holy Spirit. It's moving around over you, everyone, right now. Out in among the crowds is the Holy Spirit moving among you. How many? I want you to be honest with me, as it would be at this Bible before me. How many feels a real strange feeling like something has just come around? That's the Holy Spirit. That's Him. Now, believe me, my words are true because God vindicated His truth by the Bible, vindicated it by the power of His resurrection, vindicated it by scientific research. Then there's nothing else to prove by it. He is God. It's here. Then hear me. I'm telling you the truth. Every one of you is in the presence of God right now to be healed, a whole group of you. You believe that? Amen. Now, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you just, wherever you are, each one of you to lay hands over on one another. So that you'll see it's not me. You're, you're just as effective. You're a believer. If you feel that Holy Spirit, it's on you. Maybe not in a gift like this, but that Holy Spirit's on you. Someone, no matter who it is, lay hands on somebody. And then bow your head. Lay your hands on somebody and bow your head. I feel led to do this. I feel that it's time for your healing. <laughs> if thou canst believe. Oh, the Holy Spirit moving over the audience. That little fellow yonder from Georgia praying for your brother sitting back yonder. Have faith, believe. Oh, it's just everywhere. It's just everywhere. Now, don't you pray for yourself. You pray for the person you got your hands on. That will make every one of you praying for one another. Now, Lord Jesus, the Son of God, who has raised from the dead even the threats of Pontius Pilate and the Roman government seal could not hold you in the grave. God the Almighty came down on the day of the Easter and rolled back the stone, breaking the seal. And you rose up and was with your disciples 40 days, commissioned them to go into the world and do these things that's being done now. That's been 2,000 years ago. Lord, you are God. You cannot fail. You're here. This conference this morning that we've had, we've reasoned together about these things. We've reasoned that you are God. Reason the reason that you are God and the reason that you're here. And now we have a commission from you to lay hands on one another. That's what you commissioned us to do. You said these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. That's our commission from the conference. Our Lord, obedience is better than sacrifice, heartening than the fats of ram. Now, Lord, as your servant, I commission and command every devil, every spirit, every sickness, every affliction, every contrary thing that's bothering these people in the presence of God, by the witness of the Holy Ghost, by the commission of an angel sent to me, I challenge this spirit by the word of God, this spirit of sickness and afflictions, come out of the people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let them be well. Let them go. Satan, you're just a bluff. We've called your hand. The time has come when Jesus Christ has manifested himself in the presence of the Gentiles. Now, Satan, you are defeated. One time you held people. You have no legal rights now. Jesus Christ stripped you of every right that you had at Calvary. He paid the full price and said, It is finished. Every complete plan of salvation, all the healing, all was finished at Calvary. And you were taken from you everything that you once possessed through sin and through the fall. Now we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And you cannot hold us any longer. We say, leave us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now keep your hands on one another. Keep praying. Keep your hands. Keep praying. Each one of you is thinking, God is near. God's Spirit is here. God is healing me. His goodness. His mercy. 
His kindness, His promises being made real in me. We could preach on for weeks and weeks. It wouldn't make any difference now. The Holy Spirit's here. That's all it could do any time. Be right here now. Right now, I believe the Holy Spirit manifests to me, proven to me that God is here. I believe Him. It's a finished work. I have it. It's my possession. I now am filling with the Holy Spirit. My diseases, my aches and pains are leaving. All my afflictions are going away from me. That's the way to be praying with your head bowed, eyes closed. Only believe Keep your heads bowed now. We're going to sing now. It's quietly. Only be coming down from the mountain. An epileptic child. The disciples had been there consulting with the Father. The Father went to Jesus and said, Lord, help my child. He said, I can if you believe. I can if you'll believe. That's what he's saying now. I'm here. I've just come down from glory. I'm here. I'm in your midst. I'm holding this conference with you. I know it is a pastor. I'm here. I can, if you believe, for all things are possible. Only believe. Only believe. Oh.